first time I heard about STEAM was when I came to Dubai and during an interview, um, I was told that you know, I need to change from STEM to STEAM. And being uh, a sort of slightly stubborn, stubborn woman, um, I needed lots of good reasons of, to why I would need to change my uh, thinking from STEM to STEAM. And I must say, I've been encouraged, and uh, today has been uh, really useful, and meeting colleagues uh, that show uh, different ways of educating and why they're important. So we've got a very basic uh, session and, and, and presentation to go through. And then I'm going to give my colleagues a chance to come into the conversation and share some of their experiences. It's not a debate as such. There's not really a winner here. Um, but we'd really like to hear uh, your views. And there's just you know, a few of us that have made it to the sort of twilight zone. So please uh, don't be shy. It's a, a really small audience. So where did it all start? Well, it started in America. Um, STEM was an uh, initiative that, that the uh, Knowledge of Science team put together. There was a big problem in the US, um, lots and lots of jobs coming up in the STEM professions, science, technology, engineering and maths, and they worked out only about 3% of all graduates were graduating in engineering, and there was going to be a 5 million shortfall of uh, employees to fill their job market. So that's really where it started, and lots of funds were put into STEM. Uh, to create uh, opportunities for, for those uh, students that were showing really good, strong uh, skills in, in those separate, um, separate uh, curriculum areas. Then, in the UK, we realised the same thing, that actually um, 50, I think it's about 54% of children were taking, or students were taking creative studies. Although the stats said 45% were taking a science degree, when you broke that down, it was only actually 2% that were taking physics, and I think it was about 3% that were taking maths. So we actually don't have as many uh, scientists that we think we've got, because lots of the sciences come under things like social sciences and languages of science, creative sciences. So we realized in the UK, similarly to, to um, the USA, that we were going to have a similar problem. So we all uh, became very enthusiastic about STEM. So for me, that's where it all came from. Uh, I'm going to watch a little bit of a video now, and this guy uh, works for an organization that uh, believes STEM is the way forward. So we can play the video. Doing some of the most in-demand and high-paying careers? Well, we are too. So we asked a group of students to help us get to the bottom of it. The results are interesting. Here's how it worked. We provided a series of job titles and asked the kids to place them on the scale according to how cool they think each job is. Then we had them repeat the process, only this time we used an image to represent each job. We chose not to mention that they were actually the same jobs from the first exercise. The rankings for well-known careers like doctors, teachers, and carpenters remain relatively consistent in each exercise. However, the rankings for the STEM careers, they changed quite a bit. Why? Well, let's take mechanical engineer for example. What do you think a mechanical engineer does? Um, fixes, hmm. invents mechanical things like, like a, f like a football helmet, like anything. They fix mechanical stuff? Like a mechanical bowl or something? Things with technology? And sort of not really, but maybe fixes up a couple of plumbing things. Yeah, builds them a little bit. If nobody knows what these careers are all about, how will they know if it's something they'd be interested in? As a country, we need more science, technology, engineering, and mathematics professionals. Employers are struggling to find the right talent to fill their open positions, yet, only 6% of today's high school seniors will get a bachelor's degree in a STEM discipline. So what can we do? Inspire the younger generations to follow their passions while exploring fields that set them up for success. A career in a STEM field can be exciting, in demand, and in many ways part of something they're already passionate about. Help us shape the world of work. Okay, so 
that highlights that the, the sorts of careers that we have a shortfall in, uh, pupils, you know, 11, 12 years old actually don't know what those jobs are. And that's why STEM became very important to, to education in the US and in the UK. Um, but then along came Steve, and just as we started getting our feet into STEM and making some progress and bringing more girls into engineering and physics and science, uh, STEAM came and we have the A, which really stands for arts. And it's interesting because with this conference, if you notice on the graphic, the A is in the capital letter. So STEM has become lowercase and the art has become the uppercase. Now that's relevant, and Ian's going, I'm going to pass on to Ian in a moment, who can tell you an awful lot about why that's uh, very useful. But what does it mean for the future of STEM? Is STEM now going to, to withdraw? Are we going to talk only about STEM, uh, only about STEAM? And, and that's really what I just want us to sort of take away today from um, this kind of discussion, is where, what's the future, what's next? Let's, let's see what uh, brought STEAM into play. Oh, sorry, we'll go back and we'll... No, that's... Sorry, we'll play the video, which is that one. Thank you. Hi. There you go. Artists and scientists share the ability to look at the world differently. It's all about looking at the world in a new way that will enable new types of arts or new types of scientific solutions. STEAM is a comprehensive, integrated approach to both learning and teaching. STEAM is changing education in a fundamental way because it combines the arts with science, technology, engineering, and math, all of which make a much more creative classroom. Putting the arts in STEM to create STEAM is a great way to capture the minds and the imagination of kids and get them involved in the process. Artists can do things that they can innovate, they can think outside the box, they can create things that don't exist, that may exist in the future. And in this way, art and science are very related. It's all about investigation, it's all about looking at a field of possibilities, and, and then as an artist or as a scientist, looking at those possibilities and bringing them get together to, to create something, something new. The arts have come from and have contributed to the concepts in STEM for literally thousands of years and this is a time for them to do that, that, that great work, that magic for American children in, in American schools uh, because we need STEAM in order to advance as a nation. This year Regeneron is celebrating its 20... Thank you. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Ian, uh, and if you can just follow that up, Ian, about what is it that excites you um, about STEAM? Well, I think the video says it all, um, Samantha, and, you know, I'm, people often ask, I'm a mathematics teacher by training, so theoretical physicist, and people often ask, you know, how do I feel about this transition from STEAM to STEM, I'm uh, sorry, from STEM to STEAM, and I, said, I say to them often that, you know, we're all artists. Um, you know, all human beings are artists. We think creatively. Um, we're born into a natural state um, whereby we can think creatively. And it shouldn't lie outside of that sphere of STEM and, you know, STEM. And the A, the artistic component, is a critical part of being mathematical. Engineers are very creative beings. Um, scientists are very creative beings. And I think the processes that artists go through, let's say I'm not a visual artist, but I sing, I dance, I act. Um, the same process that one goes through in a rehearsal, a lot of those processes are followed. For example, in mathematics, if you're differentiating a really complex um, equation or you're integrating a really complex um, integral, um, it's really important that you follow process in order to um, get to the end. There's also a certain amount of beauty in it, being a mathematician myself, and I think 
as one experiences that um, time and time again, you begin to realize that the two are not um, diametrically opposed and they're, they're quite um, interlocked. I mean, you just saw in the video a, a fractal um, which deals with the idea of a complex number. You know, if I just talked about complex numbers on their own, no one would really understand that. But you go back to your primary school days and you talk about paint and, um, you know, putting two or three colors there and putting the paper together and unfolding it. That's mathematical. You know, we see it as artistic. It, it has its artistic capabilities and its, its aesthetics um, in and of itself. However, it's very mathematical. And why shouldn't we be teaching those very complex concepts at a very early age? Okay, so, Tom, do you think that the A actually needed to be put into STEM to make that clear? Uh, into STEM to make that clear? So, for, for, for me, working, working at Ranches now, STEM, STEM was brought to, sort of, to my attention similar time to Samantha when we, when we first came to, to, to Ranches Primary School. And having spent time setting up a STEM specific room, and teaching the subject myself, I find that art itself is integrated already. You know, it permeates through in, in absolute support um, of, what, of what's just been said there. So to then decide to change the acronym to, to, to include actual art, I don't see as a necessarily a necessary step. You know, and, and this isn't about saying one is right and one is wrong. However, it's, it's already there. And with the inclusion as well as we've seen of uh, the eye for innovation, innovation is already there. When you look at engineers, these people are creative, they are artistic. Um, mathematicians, factors, as you just said, it's already artistic. It's, it's, it's already so ingrained within that notion of STEM that the focus for me should be on good quality CPD within, within the subject itself, within the way it's taught, developing the curriculum to incorporate it at a whole school level so that everyone can be involved and all types of learning, all types of uh, children can appreciate the subject. Okay. Just, to, uh, just one more comment on this. I mean, I think I remember when the whole STEM acronym came about in the US, I, I am American, um, and it, the, the idea behind STEM was to get girls and minorities, for lack of a better word, um, involved um, in these subjects, uh, as you mentioned in your statistics in your introduc introduction, um, you know, the numbers are in the single digits in terms of percentages of people in the United States going into mathematics. We're closing down mathematics departments. We're closing down science departments because um, very few students are taking up these subjects. And when you think about it, um, we need more <laughs> mathematicians. We need way more scientists than, you know, even I would like to see 30%, 40% of the world um, majoring in mathematics or some science-related field, you know, that's not social sciences, however, physical or life sciences. And, you know, it seems to be going the other way. Um, so whatever we can do to raise the profile and create that level of interest uh, for the 21st century learner, um, I'm all for it. And as I said, you know, in my beginning remarks, um, we're all artistic and creative human beings. So if that's the entry point that we can create um, within our young people to get them excited about mathematics and to see that there is beauty, not just aesthetic beauty in mathematics, however, it's about process and it's about logic and it's, you know, an artist doesn't just start painting, you know, they use perspective. Um, that's a mathematical construct. Yet, people say, oh, you're just doing math, we just need the sums, we just need the answer when there's so much geometry involved in math and there's so much physicality involved in it and creativity. So I think it's really essential that the A is there and that we give rise to that so that we spark that interest for our 21st century learners. So I suppose we could look at it, is the A there for teachers, for educators, or is the A there for students to get them interested. I think if, if we're looking at it from a, a teacher's point of view, these ever-changing curriculums and these ever-changing acronyms, uh, we've, we've got STEAMY, um, which is a fun, uh, a fun yes. the latest one. Ian, how do you feel about that? We, you know, obviously, we've now gone from STEM to STEAM to STEAMY, and, and the next one is STREAM, uh, mm -hmm. which is re religion as well involved. Is, is this now a worry to you in terms of watering down STEAM? 
Um, no, I wouldn't. I think there's space for everyone. Um, I think there's there's room for religion to play into to these aspects when you look at mathematics and contributions that um, you know the Arabic culture, for example, or Islam um, have contributed um, greatly to the development of mathematics, um, algebra, um, notably, and also a lot of geometrical patterns and tessellations and so on. So I think there could be a lot of, um, there are many links there uh, to that. When you, when you talk about um, STEMI, you know, you're talking about innovation, um, as it were. You know, and those subjects lend themselves very well um, to innovation. So I think there's room for everyone. Um, I really like the idea of STEAM, however, um, moving from STEM to STEAM. And that's sort of my platform, um, as it were. OK. And, and, and Tom, you're, you're currently a, a STEM enthusiast. How do you feel about moving from STEM through STEAM if we end up at STEAMy or STREAM? To, to, for for, <laughs> for me, fun. With, the, uh, with the apparent ever-increasing uh, size of this acronym, I, I can, it, it would be a worry that what would end up happening is that, in fact, we dilute it down so much we lose the original focus, which was purely to encourage the science, technological, mathematical, and engineering job market, uh, predominantly with with girls and with, with, with females, with that market still being incredibly incredibly small. Um, Can you give some examples about the types of activities that go on in the STEM room at school? So we were looking at the history of Dubai with our students, and they investigate buildings, uh, the architectural design of them looking at the artistic design of them, you know, that also being incorporated, um, looking at weatherproofing. Now, all of this, all of this design work then led these children to create and, and build their own versions of buildings that they then think are the future. This work then led them into being invited to the Urban Thinkers Conference, which was last week, and ended up meeting UN um, United Nations representatives uh, who were going to be presenting ideas for futuristic cities, the city that we need. Now that came about without any dilution from an A being in there or an I being in there. It came from STEM and all that's integrated within that. And f for me, any good teacher will incorporate the skills that their context requires. So whether that's the context of the society that they're from, the culture that they're from, or even as, as, as small as the school or classroom that they're within, any good teacher will recognize the needs within that room. And if they have something like STEAM to, to base their concepts upon, then the teaching will occur. You just said STEAM, I suppose. STEM. So this is the thing. We don't, none of us know which one to use. So Ian, tell me, uh, what does a good STEAM lesson look like? Or is it a STEAM curriculum? Or is it a STEAM school? I think it's all three. And um, I would like to think, you know, from a Talim perspective, that we have, you know, STEAM schools. Um, we've got quite a few programs um, cropping up all over our schools. And I want to see the artistic component um, embedded. So let's say, for example, this is the yearly play uh, that we're doing. We're getting the math departments involved. Um, we're getting kids in the design technology component to build and design sets on CAD. Um, I heard in the previous session they were talking about programming. So we're talking about programming in terms of technological programming, which is, is something that has kind of gone by the wayside. When I learned to teach math ages ago, programming was part of my degree. Um, it somehow you know, went left field with the evolution of computers, and it sits in that sort of realm. Um, however, it's now coming back into mathematics teaching, a lot of apps out there, and so on. And you know, so you can have a play with its drama and its music and all of that, while maintaining the mathematical integrity, the technological component, and getting kids involved in the scientific aspect, what type of materials. Um, you know, lend themselves well to getting things off and on stage, looking at pulleys in physics, and you know, how do you get things to be hoisted up or lowered down? And I, I guess the, the fear 
um, with following that, that type of curriculum may be that, that those children with those fantastic skills go into theatre work, you know, um, when there, there's a kind of a gap in the career. So how do we, if we then get children so um, enthusiastic, because I think those ideas are just fantastic, and it, surely that's just really good teaching, and, and goes back to what Tom said, that, you know, all schools should really be teaching all of this uh, anyway. Um, but the, I guess the worry from the STEM enthusiasts are that we will make maths and science um, very attractive by introducing art or, and then flooding an area of the market that, that's already, you know, it's already flooded, saturated mm. with applicants for jobs and then removing those, those very well um, able pupils from following careers in those sort of pure physics and um, engineering. I actually take a different view because I see, you know, integrating the five subjects as a way of showing students that the skills can be transferable, as it were. So maybe the students won't go into theatre, maybe some will, we hope, but also some will see that engineering is a critical aspect. So learning about design, design of buildings, design of structures, um, learning about simple pulleys, you know, the wind. Wind is everywhere. So we tend to avoid it in a theoretical environment, but um, <laughs> you know, in a practical environment it's everywhere. So understanding those implications, um, so it, it sparks inquiry. Okay, so, and so it could be a route in. Absolutely, yeah. and then once they start to inquire more and more, but it's also the role of the teacher to ensure that you know, the teacher is prompting that inquiry. So not just looking at building a set for the purpose of building a set, but what are the implications um, required in structural building? You know, what's the structural integrity look like? I built a garden with um, some 14-year-olds um, last year and we were looking at the structural integrity. Will it hold up? This is in the UK. Will it hold up in the elements? You know, what sorts of materials do we need to ensure that it holds up? So it wasn't set building. Uh, it was simply the frame for a garden, but it took almost three months, but it involves so much, you know, from writing a proposal to getting the funding to looking at the materials and doing the math and getting the science right. So I wonder whether we, we need any acron acronyms at all. You know, this is good education, isn't it? It doesn't really matter what we call it. Uh, I think we're going to get ourselves really tripped up by all these uh, different different acronyms that are available. I think the last thing I want to discuss before we open up to the, the few people we, I can see out there is this, the, the gender issue. You know, Tom, do you think that there's a gender issue um, out there at the moment with, with girls uh, not wanting, if, if, if we looked at Ian's um, points there, would those girls naturally feel more creative? Would they use their skills to go perhaps into theatre, into costume design, uh, rather than into uh, physics? You know, uh, how do we solve that uh, as, as uh, educators? Yeah, I mean, the, the statistics are out there at the moment that, that, that girls aren't going into the, the, the technological, the engineering, mathematical style jobs. Uh, I think the inclusion of art, I think is absolutely right, it would, it, would, it would provide a way in for people who perhaps see barriers to these subjects and barriers to these names. So, I mean, sort of touch, touching back on the point you made there about whether we need an acronym, do we need simply a, a, a curriculum, actually, that focuses more on concepts, that focus on things like innovation, uh, and, and then teachers themselves simply teach based on skills, and as people pick up these skills, as people are enthused and through good quality teaching, you can integrate projects, um, projects like what you were just talking about, a three-month project, which will incorporate every subject, every teacher, all specialisms, and enthuse children to experience education in the way that suits them. So concept learning, mm -hmm. character education, uh, there's so many different types. I, I mean, I think at the moment, I mean, I've probably been in education about 20 years, I think, and there's more freedom than ever as a principal um, to set up your own curriculum. And I think that's, you know, that's an, an, amazing, um, an amazing situation for us to be in, but it does mean uh, the exam, if we go back to the PISA exam, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, if the PISA exam is still focusing on, on maths and science, if we become a very uh, concept-based uh, educators, uh, stream, um, steamy, are we going to still f meet the, the Dubai initiative that we need to go up the PISA ranking? I believe so, you think so? wholeheartedly. I, um, I had the privilege of running a project-based program for the Harvard um, Project Zero um, Foundation, 
and back in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we did not focus on exam, exam taking at all. Um, it was all project-based. It was linked to the um, Department of Education standards, of course, but it was all project-based. Students were out in, and this was, what, 15 years ago. We're going back 15 years. And students were engrossed in projects, as we saw earlier this morning with the, the whole planting, planting the seeds and so on. But my students were out in the field, you know, going to the JFK Library, doing research. They were, um, you know, down at the Harvard Library, you know, the Mathematics Library, um, looking up, you know, various things. And it, it worked. Their results shot through the roof. And not once did I say to them, well, you have to practice this exam. And when it came time to sit the exam, my student results were far higher than anyone else's in the state. And I'm sure that those are the classrooms. They were practicing how to take the test. It's called the Massachusetts Comprehensive Assessment System, or test, um, as it's known. And my students were at the top of the tables. And not once did I, I say, OK, you guys are going to be taking this test tomorrow and the day after they went in. They sat their math tests, they sat their science tests, they met the requirement for graduation, and their results were outstanding. And they were deemed to be failures, actually. Right. A lot of them had actually flunked out of the normal system. Yeah. And little did they know that they were taking a test, a high stakes test, because I didn't make them aware of it. They just went in naturally and did what they had to do. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's incredible. I think, you know, if we can move away from teaching to the tests and have that confidence, then children are going to be happier, their well-being would be better, parents' stress would be lower. Um, whether we're calling it STEM, STEAM, uh, the fact that we're, children are, are learning and developing through doing um, is, is, is got to be the, the, the main thing. Um, of, yeah, oh, finish with Tom. Com coming down to, to all of that, I mean, it comes from very good quality schools, good quality teaching that will bring children to the forefront of their own, bring, bring children to the forefront of their own abilities. In, uh, in the UK, we had, a, we had a project where we brought in a huge, great tent with puffing smoke and everything coming out of it. Uh, none of the staff were told what it was, but all we were told to do is prepare skill teaching. All we had to do is know what our children needed, know what would sort of enthuse them, uh, have, some, have some skills ready to teach, um, and we were going to come in on Monday morning and something was going to happen. We had fire engines, police officers, and our head teacher being dragged out by police officers dressed up, um, and scientists. Now, for the full week, the children were able to drive their own learning whilst the teachers were able to steer through skill-based inquiry. Uh, so it's a really, I think, when it comes down to looking at STEAM, STREAM, STEAMy, all of these things, it will come down to good quality teacher training, High, highly motivated staff that, that, that know exactly how to get the best out of their children. Great. I think what we've learned today, and I think what the What Works conferences usually tell us, is to sort of put the textbooks down for a moment, uh, to, to re-educate parents not to have to keep checking the books, that there needs to be things written down in books for our children to be learning. Uh, you know, I think, if, if anything, we all agree here um, that learning needs to be doing and it needs to have uh, lots of energy and lots of thought and lots of diversity. Um, if we could put the lights up, I'd like to try to involve a few of you out there just to see what, uh, what experiences you have in your schools, um, whether or not you're a STEM or a STEAM or you don't mind. Um, is anyone willing to, to join in the conversation? Lovely, thank you, lady here. <laughs> uh, okay, um, six years ago when we, uh, our grade six students, they are our seniors, and we start the um, design and technology for them, DT. The next year in our curriculum, we, ha we, are, we have a, a kind of combined Iranian and the American curriculum at the same time. So they start to have a, some kind of research kind of thing. So we added RDT, research design and technology. Next year, the STEAM comes to our school. So we change completely to the kind of STEAM or RDT. Our student kind of brainstorm at that time. At the same time, we, we didn't have that EI extra things. But we add R, we call it research instead of religion. So we have a stream in our school but it's a science, engineering, research, oh. and uh, things. Out of curiosity, just uh, as that acronym changed for you during your time, mm -hmm. 
did you find that the actual teaching of the subject changed dramatically? Yes, completely. So because at the beginning, we have it just, just a design and technology. Just to put in, giving some project, they do the, some uh, you know, design. And, and then we add the research to it. The student have to go following the, even the citation. Doing the, in the grade seven, they have to follow everything, do the research for their program. When we add those STM, other math, everything, again, they, uh, our math curriculum is very high standard. You know, we have a, this year we have IB students. Um, most of, we have a 25 IB students. Most of the girls have a high level physics. Almost everybody have a high level math. So this is something they are, uh, you know, actually the girls ask us to offer the high level physics. Great. So that's why the kind of combination of all of these things, most of them going to engineering field. So that's why it's, it's not, it's very smooth for our school. We didn't have any problem to adding the letter to our curriculum. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Since uh, actually uh, I have green school in Adli uh, from third to fifth, we teach uh, maths. Math is all about size and shapes. We take them to field, and the students draw the circle, semicircle, rectangle, all the shapes. Then the students uh, put the grain, different grains, and then they just watch. The bird comes, so bird take the grains. So students learn everything. Yeah. This is the beyond classroom experience I have, yes. and I call that a green curriculum. Oh, yes. So they learn the math, the environment, the science, and the patience. So they need to watch the words, and that they they need to name the words. So we connect. Uh, I'm connecting curriculum into the, with the environment. Mm -hmm. So a student remains sensitive toward the environment. That's why I teach in maths in early age. Like uh, if I'm teaching about the bird, so the same art teacher will draw the bird. And the language teacher also tells the story about the bird. Yeah. Though the student will remain connected with the one, that learning takes place and the, the revision is not required. This is my personal experience. So, my so it seems Thank that one thing that runs through all of all the comments and all of the statements is that co-learning, cross-curricular, yeah, yes. every subject can be taught through yes, yes, all yes. of the means. I've done this. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, lady behind you. Thank you. Hi, um, Hi. I'm not a teacher. I it's work okay. for KHDA, <laughs> but um, this is really interesting. When I was doing science, when I was in G well, yeah, during my GSSE years, my science teacher used to teach me biology and physics using storytelling and art. And I never knew about stream or steam or any of that then, <laughs> but um, it really worked for me. And when I was tutoring my little brother, I, did, I used the same technique. I used to take him out in the garden and paint and teach him. Well, all the teachers at school told me that he's not going to get his GSSEs, he's not hardworking, or they thought that he had um, a learning disorder or something. And I said, it's the way that you're teaching him. So that I, I started taking it upon myself to teach him every evening. And I used art, and I used storytelling, and it worked. Yeah. Yeah. So I think combining them does work. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's lots and lots of research out there that, that tell us that children learn in different ways, and, you know, and, and a really good teacher or a parent needs to find the way that that child can learn. Um, schools, I think, have moved on. Well, not all of them, I'm sure, and in, not in all countries at all. Um, but this, this linear route to educating pupils, whereby the children just have to fit the way that the teacher's working, is, isn't going to work. Uh, you're going to have some very high excelling pupils, but you're going to have some very bad suicide rates for children who just aren't making it. And, you know, if anything, uh, yeah, out of all of this STEM, STEMI, and uh, STREAM education, I think we, if we can all come together to understand that children are all different, and if we can offer these types of subjects in a variety of ways, in a variety of uh, teaching styles and strategies, we're going to surely have the best chance of, of success. And those children that may be more dominant with, with their physics, and whether they came from the storytelling start, or, or whether they were... Um, bred through the very genetic, great genetic pool from their, their parents to be um, mathematicians from, from day one, that there's a place for, for, for that type of education too. Um, 
and uh, where, where the child has come from an artistic background, that they have a route to come through the Arctic, uh, artistic route to one of these jobs that isn't filled. And, you know, we have a lot of teachers and we, well, we, we're actually getting a shortage of teachers, so I'll track that. Um, but there, there, there are certain jobs out there that are just not being filled when, uh, you know, Steve Fritz telling us about this vertical farming. We need to produce more children that can farm vertically. We need to produce more children that can have those sorts of ideas. Um, so concept learning, ideas, whether it starts from the arts, um, I don't think matters, but I think we need to agree on an acronym. <laughs> we're, not, we're probably not going to do it here unless we go back to basics and just call it education. Yeah. yeah. Got a question. I think we'll. we'll uh, one, one, one question. Uh, one at the back. The hi. Uh, within Dubai and internationally, where do you look for best practices of STEM? Ignoring the rest of the evidence, what is the best practice? I, I think coming to conferences is great because you can then network with people like you, you know we could say if you want to come and see a, a STEM room which other uh, schools have done then they've come to see Tom's room and it's for children aged five and six really we have a, a, a science lab for when children are older but this STEM room just has just different zones and there's no chairs so you could start by just coming to look at how we set up what was a storeroom because we were a new school we haven't got huge amounts of pupils or money um, so we set up a storeroom to become a STEM room uh, and so you can start there and say well you know what projects have you managed to to do I think if you looked just at results you know who's doing well in science and math you might want to find out why and 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 and, and look at that you know how are they teaching it is it a very linear way, are they teaching to the test or are there some innovations going on there? Um, I think Dubai is slightly short of networking. Um, I think we're, we're hoping to move away now from uh, the sort of the competitive schools and try to work a bit more collaboratively, um, visiting each other's schools more often, seeing good practice because there are an awful lot of children in Dubai and you know, if we all work together to raise education I think we'll have a better better chance of raising uh, the, you know, up, up, up the Pisa League. I think if we work in isolation and, and um, only your school is doing really well in maths and science, that's not going to make a difference to our bigger community. I also think, um, to answer your question, uh, an inquiry-based approach, so looking for schools um, that have classrooms that really promote inquiry. So I know the IB programs, international baccalaureate programs, um, definitely have a, a huge push toward you know, promoting inquiry even at the diploma level, but more so in the middle years, in the primary years, the new national curriculum um, from the UK has definitely got a huge injection of, you know, inquiry-based learning, transdisciplinary understandings, but getting our teachers on, on board with that, getting our teachers more PD, and by watching it in the classroom and getting them to think through inquiry. So you pose a question as opposed to, you know, we've got an objective and we need to make sure we meet that objective. Well, you're going to meet the objective is if there's natural learning and inquiry. So the students have to get really switched on um, to why they're in the classroom every day. They need to look forward to being there and that you're going to not entertain them, but you're going to challenge them, you know. Another uh, really good route for uh, CPD is, is the TED Talks. Um, YouTube, so the, the clips I showed you, were, they're just on YouTube, they're, they're available, you just need to put in, you know, STEM, STEAM, STEAMY, and you get a whole host of, of, of different um, clips, and then from those, if some of those are based nearby, you know, you can make contact with them, some of them have uh, packs that, that you can have, um, that they'll send you, uh, ideas, workshops that are going on, um, Yammer, which we're being introduced to, um, there's Yammer discussion groups that go on about STEAM and STEM that you can also tap into. Twitter is another fabulous source. So if, you're, if you have your own Twitter, um, you, you can actually search for people who are twi twitting, <laughs> tweeting um, about STEM and STEAM and then go and meet them and, um, and make links that way. So we're just going to finish then. So what does the future look like? Hopefully, uh, excellent teaching, teaching that gets the children off their seats um, and, and, and working in groups, working collaboratively, whether it's STEM, whether it's STEAM, whether it's STEAMy or STREAM. I think we're all trying to do the same thing. But I'd like to finish by saying, try to remember with STEM that there is a shortfall out there. So remember that there, that there are jobs out there that our pupils are currently not going towards and whichever route we take to get them there we do need uh, to keep that 
that in, in our minds that that's really where this whole thing started from and wh whatever we do however much it changes and molds to fit our schools and our pupils the aim is, is to meet that directive of, of getting more pupils, especially girls, into education and, and therefore into jobs for engineering, science, maths and technology. Okay, uh, I'd say thank you to Tom here, uh, thank you to Ian and thanks for staying so late, really nice to have you with us. <laughs> thank you for this interesting conversation. This presentation this presentation marks the close of What Works team. Can we just take the opportunity to thank you for being with us today? And don't forget to join us once again on the 22nd of February for our What Works event, What Works Early Years. We wish you all a safe journey home. Thank you. <laughs>